Okay. Okay. I got a one question. One question. Do people still dab? Is dabbing a still still a thing? Is is I know it's weird. I know it sounds really weird, but I was working with somebody today and they they suggested in their book that somebody would dab on them. And I I don't know if like I don't know if that's still a thing. So if it is a thing or or not a thing, just let, I'm sure somebody listening to this at some point will tell me, "Oh no, John, that's not a thing. We don't do that anymore." Just just let me know, would you? I, I told him it wasn't a thing because I, I can't remember hearing it in the last like three months, but um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Also, if I sound out of breath, it's because like two minutes ago, I ran down to the kitchen because I thought, oh no, oh no, I have no water. What am I going to do? So I'm running down to the kitchen and uh, I, I take a, I, I can't, I, like, there's not enough time. I'm, I'm under pressure, but I got to come back. I got to, I got to go, I got to go do the chat. So I, I don't have time. I just grab a bottle of water. I come running, running back up here. You know what's sitting right here on the, on the desk next to me? Big, big mug of water. Been there. Oh gosh. An hour, two hours, whatever my meeting prior to this one was. Just like a dope, just completely forgot about it. But so now we are well hydrated, that's for sure. And I don't know if you know this, but shh, 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 just, just two seconds. Okay, hang on. We miked the sleeping cat because everybody deserves a little bit of cat, you know, a little bit of calm, a little bit of chill. I know I used to get a lot of grief for playing music in the background during the Wednesday, when this was on Wednesday nights. So hopefully purring cat is not so bad, hopefully. You want to get started? You want to get started? You want to do this? Okay, let's do this. All right. Just remember what I've taught you. Now, I will point out that that is the wrong graphic up for this week. I really, Linus, I have to turn you down just a little bit because I want to be able to focus on what I'm saying. Uh, that is the wrong graphic. So if you're watching this on YouTube, don't freak out. This is the writer's chat for November the 14th. I just forgot to change the graphic on this slide. Uh, I clicked the wrong thing when I was loading this up. My terrible apologies. I goofed. So um, here, I feel bad. Let's let's immediately fix this. Hang on. Here. Uh, we'll get that fresh graphic right up. And it's going to be ginormous. But there you go. There's the proof. There you go. It's the writer's chat for the 14th. And through no fault of my own, I continue to be John, the guy who's going to help you write better. Hi. Ladies and gentlemen, guys, gals, non-binary pals, friends, writers, cat purr enthusiasts, anybody who had lunch in the last 45 minutes, people who wait all week and then don't ask a question despite saying they're going to ask a ton of questions someday, anybody who's ever had to untangle headphone cables like urgently while the phone is still ringing, people who randomly send you a, a text like, hey, you busy five minutes before you're going to do anything. Uh, people who show up early to Zoom meetings, anybody who's ever enjoyed a really good piece of fish for lunch, people who uh, uh, like really value good pesto, audiobook enthusiasts, anybody who doesn't spam randomly on social media, and most importantly, the comrades. Hey, how have you been? Everything all right? You doing good? Apparently, out in the world, on the other side of this wall, way out there in the universe, it is a lunatic day for all different kinds of reasons, social and otherwise. So I'm hoping that here today, the writer's chat, I can give you something calm. Hence, 
the microphone cat. Let's be soothing. Let's be tranquil. Let's, you know, try to do this right. If you don't know what this is and you have no idea what's going on, this is the writer's chat where I'm going to answer 13, a baker's dozen worth of questions all about writing, editing, publishing, marketing, being a writer, as well as the questions of those people in chat. So let's say hi to chat. Hello, Twitch. Hello, YouTube in the future. Hi, podcast party people. Um, it's nice to have you here. Feel free at any time if you're ever watching this live at twitch.tv forward slash John helps you write better or checking this out on youtube.com forward slash John Adamus. Uh, if you're on YouTube, by the way, uh, leave your questions down in the comments and they will get added to the list for the next chat. I super duper promise. Um, yeah, I answer questions. You ready? I got 13. They're going to be great. Here we go. Question number one. Why do you think people are so interested in the writing routines of other writers? You know how when you've got a thing to do, like an errand or a chore, and you don't want to do it because it's, I don't know, messy or annoying or boring, or you'd wish you just were doing something else. So you suddenly, instead of doing that thing, whatever it is, you suddenly become very interested in something else. Like, oh, wait, I got to do laundry or, oh, I got to, you know, clean the bathroom or something. Uh, it can wait. Let me, let me, let me watch one more video. What, one more thing. One, let me, uh, I can't, I can't do that right now. I can't take the trash out right now. I'm like, the episode's not over. I'll wait till the end of the episode. And you find all these different interesting reasons to not do the thing you want to be doing. That's this case. People love knowing what famous, particularly very famous, very dead writers did like hundreds of years ago, thinking that that's going to give them some kind of profound insight. And there are some fantastic books all about writer routines, but when you sit down and read them, like really pay attention to them, a lot of these people were malnourished, uh, un barely hydrated. They were you know, indigent at best, they were starving. They were just sick and unhappy. And somehow, given the fact that they didn't exist in the same capitalist hellscape you and I do, somehow they managed to make art. I wonder how that works. So knowing the writing routine of, let's say, Balzac uh, does not help you today because the world you live in and the world Mr. Balzac lived in, yeah, I said it, not the same world. But if I find out about a lot, of, a lot about writing routines for all different kinds of people, even people who lived 50 years ago, if I find out a lot about a writing routine, that means I'm being a writer. No, no, you're not. You have found a writing adjacent way to avoid writing. I think people are really interested because it seems like it's really helping, but it's just one more detour. It's just one more, you know, way to take a break from the thing you're trying to do. That's exactly why I think people... Don't do this. Are, are they interesting? Sure. It's totally interesting to find out that, you know, Picasso, uh, not Picasso, Van Gogh ate a lot of potatoes. And of course he was depressed. In it, it, delightful. Does that help in any way? No. Is that going to help you fix chapter three? No. But at least now you know a thing so that if you ever like go to a trivia contest and they ask you, hey, what did Van Gogh eat a lot of? You can say potatoes. Sure. Useful. Shall we go on to the next question? Let's. Question number two. If you don't want me in so many discords and Facebook groups, where should I be? First of all, I'm not the boss of you person asking this question. You can be in as many discords and Facebook groups as you want. You could, you could join them all. Go ahead. Be a member of everywhere that lets writers come in and sit down. Go ahead. But I'm going to ask you, what are you doing when you're there? Really? Like, what are you doing? Are you saying anything? Are, are you just trying to, like when everybody puts out a mass notification, do you click on it and go, oh, okay, it's another one. God, that's really annoying. Or oh, I'll get it later. Or are you contributing? Like actively contributing, not just being like, oh, here's a, here's a completely unrelated conversation about something that is not what I'm here for. So this is where I'll chime in. I love just chatting with people because I hate my day job. Is that what you're here for? I mean, I get hating your day job. Sure. People hate loads of day jobs because, you know, capitalism. But what are, what are you doing that you're in all these groups and Facebook groups? Are they helping? Do you think you're just somehow going to osmos? Like you join those Facebook groups that are going to help you market, but you never say the thing that you want to market. 
or you're in a discord that's, you know, all about trying to help you write better or trying to help you like learn about how to do a contract or something. And, and you never say any fucking thing. What are you, what are you doing? Why are you there? You should be, here's exactly where you should be. Let's answer your question. You should be in any group, in any space, on whatever platform where you are actually directly contributing to its improvement or the maintenance of its improvement, as well as receiving something valuable for yourself. Both of those things. Ideally, you are helping it keep being good or making it better. And you're getting something from it in return. You're not just taking up space. You're not just one more person on the list. You're not just there to say you were there. You're doing something about it. Why? Why does that matter? Because the whole point of this, the whole point of all these groups, I think, at least according to the what it says on the label, is to help you write better or help you publish books. But so often, so many of these groups, so many of these discords, so many of these spaces just turn into like water cooler moments, little coffee clatches of little clicky groups of friends who like the mean girls in high school want to isolate and ostracize and, you know, blow up an ego or two or six and then sit down and, you know, dictate to everybody how things should be. But we don't really seem to do a whole lot of talking about writing, but we do seem to do an awful lot of talking. Those are the spaces I'm talking about. That's, that's, that's what I don't like. That's where I don't want you to be. Because if I just, if, if you wanted to become a professional chatter, you could totally do that. I, I, I don't know how that would work. I'm not sure the business plan involved there, but you could do it if you wanted. Sure, go ahead. But I want you to be in places that are actually going to help you. I want you to be in places where you feel you matter. I want you to be in places where you can say something and get help or say something and provide help. I want you to contribute to make the world a better place. I want you to, to summarize this. I want you to give a shit and do well and help others do better. Otherwise, you're just taking up space. And it's not helping you. That's what I don't understand about these things. People join all these different groups and all these different newsletters and all these different things. And, and then they don't take another step. It's, I signed up for that. Okay, what's it like? Uh, I don't know. I'm not really there. Well, then why'd you sign up? Why, why, why go through the annoying, like, fill out the questionnaire on Facebook? Like, it's one thing at Discord. You just get the link, click it, and the Yahtzee, you're in. But, like... Why jump through all the hoops if you're not going to do something about it? I get that you don't have to be like, I can't talk every minute of every day. I'm not saying that. I'm asking, what are you doing and why are you there? What are you hoping to have happen? How likely is it to have that happen? What are you doing? Have you thought about it? Have you questioned it? Have you poked it with a stick? Because it's, it's, it's a good idea for you to do that. Okay? Please only go to places that help you. And if you can't help make the place into something that helps you, go elsewhere. There you go. Okay, on we go. Question number three. Any tips for writing in the second person? Man, I don't have a lot. Uh, why? Uh, because it's hard. And not a lot of people do it. And people find out how difficult it is. And they don't normally pick it up. It's not bad. It's not wrong. It doesn't mean you're unlikely to get published. It doesn't make it a bad story tool. It's just an uncommonly done thing. And a lot of people, particularly those people in some very popular genres, love to talk about how, well, it's really hard and, you know, you know, good for you for doing it, but I can't help you do it. It's just sort of one of those like, oh, you must be really ambitious, but I have nothing for you. I, I mean, I have a couple tips. So second person is all about framing. Second person is all about, uh, I want you to imagine the earth and the moon for this, right? So the moon, uh, that one, because of the way things are locked into orbit, please, I'm not an, I'm not a planetologist, so don't get mad at me if I use the wrong language, but the moon's face, the, the one side of the moon is always facing the earth because of how things are locked into orbit. You, the narrating character, you, the author, 
want to be the face of the moon that is forever facing the planet. That's the main character. That's the person of whom or to whom you are writing. So that there is always that immediate relationship and you don't really wobble or change your view. You're always sort of looking around or directly at what the planet is going through. But, and the planet is the one doing the changing. If you think about Watson and Holmes, for instance, while that is not technically true second person because we are externalizing Holmes to third person, it's the same mechanic idea, even if it's not the same productive idea. Because w Watson very rarely is away from Holmes in a substantial enough way. Like, yeah, you can, you can dip out real quick and come back, but it's not like this whole book is all Watson all day. And, oh, by the way, I guess Holmes is like, you know, just chilling on the couch watching football. You want to make sure that you've got that relationship so that the narration is always next to, adjacent to your main character doing all the action. The problem here, the wrinkle with this, is that you've got indirect agency rather than direct agency. Direct agency is where a character very clearly has the ability to do stuff. And we see them make decisions and we see them take actions. See Dick run, run Dick run, jump Jane jump. Bob makes a sandwich. These are all examples of just agency. Second person, the person doing the talking, their agency is in the talking. They're in the narration. It's not the same as like, um, I attacked the monster while, you know, chuckle fuck over here also attacked the monster because that's first person. The second person, the narrator, is always looking at somebody else doing stuff. They, the other person, I'm pointing as if that matters, but the moon always sees the earth rotating and doing shit while the moon stays fixed in one position. Again, that's why the, it's the easiest way to think about how to handle second person strong narration. Is this the only way? No. But second person is really about making sure you frame and contextualize and describe and develop what somebody else is doing. So you've got a level of proximity there. You're pretty close to it. Much like if you were standing next to me, you could put your face like real close to me and see what I'm doing. You could, you know, get all up on the cat and listen to the cat purring. You could, you know, position yourself wherever you need to see whatever you need, but that is the sum total of all that you are doing. Whereas I, in this case, the third party, me, John, is the one taking all the actions. And you're talking to me. So there's a lot of you and you framing language as opposed to John does this and John does that. Because the, it's not wrong. You're not out of second person to do that, but you are soft in your second person as opposed to strong second person, which is very much you, 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 you. Soft is a combination of proper noun plus you. We have now reached the end of my knowledge about second person. That doesn't mean by any instance that is everything the world knows about second person. It's just that I am A, unfamiliar with it, and I don't want to steer you wrong. And B, it, it really comes down to a very sort of how are you writing, what are you writing, and why is it in second person, and how can we make the dynamic between narration and character agency as strong as possible. The, the danger with second person is that you will lapse either into first person or third person just by how you are framing the action. If you spend too long away from a second person pronoun, you start moving more and more towards third. If your narrator starts to feel a little like dull, they're not doing a lot, you can start, you know, adding in some I sentences and actually you know you're in first person. This isn't a hard and fast rule. It's not like one I or one third person pronoun is going to wreck everything, but it, it is a difficult story structure to keep straight. I'm not saying not to do it. I'm just saying, remember, you got to think about the moon and earth. Great question. Now, chat, anybody, are there any questions today about anything? Like, hey, John, what did you do to the cat that the cat's making those noises? I gave the cat fish. Any questions about anything?
I would ask the cat if the cat had questions, but I don't want to wake him because he was running around all morning. So let's let the cat chill. Questions? Yes? No? All right. On we go. Question number four. How do I get over my anxiety about a blank page? All right. We have to dig a little bit. You ready? What about the blank page makes you anxious? Is it the idea that you have to fill it and that it has to be perfect? Is it the idea that you're not sure you can fill it? Is it the idea that you're not sure if your idea is worth, I'm making air quotes, worth the blank page? It's not good enough to be there. Is it just that the blank page seems huge and you, you, you freak out? It's like stage fright. What, what is the source of the anxiety? Not the cause, just what kind of anxiety are we talking about? Because that's going to tell us how to get over it, how to get past it, how to how to work with it and cope around it and then, you know, banish it to the phantom zone. A lot of anxiety around the blank page comes from expectation. You think a thing is supposed to be a certain way. It's supposed to engage the reader to a certain degree. It's supposed to be good enough, whatever that means. It's supposed to have a certain number of things. It's supposed to not have other things. It has to be a certain way in order to be good enough. You know, it, it, there's all these different weird criteria about quality and content, like what's in it, what's, what are the words on the page and what are they doing? And somehow those, they don't come from anywhere, but you just bring them with you. Those become like the hard and fast rules that make a blank page a blank page. Here's what I will tell you about a blank page. It's, it's, it's free. It is free for you to do with as you like. Do you want to write a scene with some talking? Sure, go ahead. Do you want to write the scene where, you know, the, the character has a tremendously melodramatic death? Delightful. Do you want to write a scene where it's just two people driving? Sure, cool. The blank page is absolutely free of everything and it is able to contain anything. So literally anything that goes on the page is great because it wasn't there before. Now, some people hear that and they get real cranky. They start talking about, well, yeah, but, but it's gotta be this. Sure. At the end of our whole endeavor, two drafts from now, three drafts from now, six months from now, it has to be a certain way. But that page is blank right now. It could be anything. It, this isn't chess where, you know, one, the first pawn move suddenly dictates exactly everything or mostly everything you can do or could do. It's, it's not like that at all. This is more a matter of you can do whatever the hell you want. And you have an infinite and completely up to you amount of time to do anything you want. So if you want to rewrite this thing six times, go ahead. No one, no one's asking you to, there's no requirement for you to do so, but you can beat your head senseless trying to make it perfect. I'm making air quotes before you move forward. You'd never need to. No one's going to give a shit. You're the only one who knows how hard you're struggling with it. And you don't need to struggle with it in the first place. But that blank page, instead of it being this thing that has specific requirements, like a game show that you have to guess the password to, see it instead as a broad open field in which you can do anything you want, anywhere, to any degree. No restrictions, no judgment, no hesitation, just anything you put on there. Even if we're going to delete it tomorrow, anything that goes on there is great. That's it. That's the best way to approach a blank page. Not, you know, bearing this baggage, carrying this expectation that you're supposed to write a certain scene and it has to be a certain kind of way because that's not helping you. That's not helping anybody. The reader doesn't expect that. The reader isn't thinking in those terms. And I don't care if we're talking about a consumer, just a random person who's going to buy your book, or if we're talking about a pimp, or we're talking about a publisher, or we're talking about a freelance editor, or we're talking about I don't know who. What they want, what they all want, are words on that page. They want the page to be not blank. That's it. The quality of its blankness, that's up to you. Put 
anything on there and it's great. You can always go back and make it better. You can always go back and change it entirely. You can always go back and delete it. You have absolute and entire control. So what exactly makes you anxious? Do you just think you're not good enough to do a thing? Okay. Okay. Let's, let's assume that just for a second. Let's assume you're not good enough to do this. What would demonstrate to you that you're capable of doing this? Not, not good enough to exceed, not good enough to get an A. This isn't like we have to be in the upper 1% or the upper 1% of our class. Just what would it take to be capable of doing this task? If our task is let's put words on the page, capability would be let's put words on the page. And we already said that any words that go on this page, good, bad, shitty, brilliant, otherwise, are fantastic. So just put some words on the page. Just put some words on the page. And you keep doing that, even though they might be hot shit, even though you're like, I don't know if these are going to stay. Doesn't matter if they stay. Doesn't matter if you let them go. Just matters that they're there. Tell yourself that frequently, regularly, when you're dealing with anxiety about blank pages. And I think it'll make a difference. On we go. Question number five. How do I know when the first draft is done? Why does it not feel like the right question five? Give me two seconds. Listen to the cat for a minute while I look something up. I don't think that's the right question. I think that's the old question five because I could have sworn I remember changing it to a new question five. Let's just double check real quick. I'm so well organized. It's shocking. Question five. No, that's the right question five. Okay, fair enough. My mistake, my mistake. So how do I know when the first draft is done? When the entire story, as you have come to understand it, is out of your head and on the page. Not the story that you're going to take forward, not the nearly finished to be published story, just, you know, this amount of story. When that's a thing, when when it's all out of your brain and it's on the page, that's when it's done. So if that means this thing is going to get real long and really big and blow out your word count, well, then I guess your first draft is going to blow out your word count. Good news, we have a second draft to do. So don't worry about that. The first draft is done when you have completely told the story. Period. Period. If it's too long or too short, we'll deal with that in the second draft. Just get it out of your head. That's when the first draft is done. On we go. How do I make sure I've incorporated my theme into my first draft? Good question. Uh, On one hand, I want to tell you that you don't really need to worry about your theme in your first draft because most of the time people writing a first draft just need to get the whole story out, let alone think about theme. But, but if you are looking to shape your theme, you want to make sure you know, A, you know what your theme is. And B, you want to make sure you have your theme arc, the the way the theme shows up in the story, you know, is illustrated across several scenes. So if you have a theme like uh, overcoming loneliness, let's say, then you have scenes that demonstrate the existence of loneliness, the want to change the transformation of loneliness, the act of changing from lonely to not lonely, and then the resolution in dealing with loneliness. If you can point to scenes that do the thing in the thematic arc, you can say that your theme is in your first draft. By the way, this is also how you make sure your theme is in any draft. It's not special just because it's first. And it's interesting and nice uh, that you want to put your theme in your first draft. But if you're ever feeling like, oh my God, that's so much pressure. There's so many more things I have to do in my first draft. I got all these characters and these locations and all this action and I got to figure out the climax. If the theme needs to take a back seat for a draft so that you can get the rest of it out, do that because we can always come back in the second draft and once everything is down and we're sort of looking at the parts, we can figure out how to sort of install the theme with some new parts around the existing stuff. You don't have to, no one is expecting your first draft. Just so we're clear, no one's expecting your first draft to be anything more than like 30% of the finished book. Yeah, it's great when it's like 60% similar. It's great when it's 70. It's great when it's 50. It's great when it's 10. 
there's no expectation as to how nearly done the first draft is. The first draft is just framing the house, pouring the concrete for the foundation, laying some bricks. I am not a houseologist. I'm not familiar with all the techniques of building, but I'm trying to tell you that L, any, any kind of expectation beyond the first draft is just where I vomited the thing out is an expectation you're putting on yourself that may hold you back in some way. It doesn't, no one's looking for your first draft for theme. It's nice that it's there, but it's not like, Oh shit. It's a first draft with theme skyrocket them to success. It's a first draft. Good job finishing it. And then in the second draft, that's where you do all the nuts and bolts and poking with a stick and then, you know, figure it out from there. But if you look at the elements of your theme and make sure that they're represented in scenes in your story, your theme will be incorporated into your first draft. I hope that answers your question. Are there additional questions from anyone in chat? Linus, any questions? No? Okay, buddy. You just keep chilling. Other questions from not sleeping cats? No? All right, rock and roll. On we go. Question seven. Why do I spend so much time coming up with, that ide with ideas and I spend so little time doing anything about them? Stakes. Stakes. Ideas cost you nothing. There's no, there's no risk. There's no danger. You can have all the ideas you want. You don't really judge your ideas so much. Or if you do, it's very, very binary and very, very clear. Shitty ideas just disappear. Good ideas persist. But beyond that, you don't have to do anything with them. You could just think things stuff all you want. You could just make a whole list. Here are all my ideas in a notepad file or whatever. And then you just write down ideas. And you can lie to yourself and delude yourself and, and hype yourself up and say, one day, one day, one day, I'm going to do this, this, and this. One day, I'm going to do that. One day, I'm going to get that done. One day, I'm going to start that podcast. One day, I'm going to start that painting. One day, I am going to take pictures of my feet. One day, I am going to do that thing. And as long as there is a one day that stays one day and never becomes a two day, see what I did there, um, it, ideas are fine. But the minute you have to transmogrify that, the minute you have to transform that, ideas turn into action. And action is scary because action carries with it possibility. See, because when it's an idea, you can't really fail. And you can't really be judged because the idea exists in your brain. You don't necessarily have to share it. Or when you do share it, you can just talk about it in this sort of abstract way. But the minute you start doing it and turning it into something like, I want to start a podcast. Okay, I have a microphone. Cool. But the minute it doesn't really, it just stays an idea until you press record or until you purchase, well, even you can purchase hosting. It's the minute you complete a thing and, you know, make it available to somebody else that it's out there. The act of doing something it opens us up to all the things we are afraid of about opening ourselves up. Ideas, we can just sit back insulated and protected as we might be from other people's things. Cause if you just come up with an idea, like, wouldn't it be cool one day if we all just had guns that shot baked potatoes, that's an idea. And as long as like, it's an idea, somebody can just go, John, that is a dumb idea. No one gives a shit. We can just laugh about it and move on. But if I turn around and go, what if I had a podcast where I interviewed famous people or people who I knew who I felt were famous and I asked them questions about what they were scared about? What, 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 what I do. And what if I called it something like, I don't want to be scared anymore. And then I, I tried, you know, making that happen because it as an idea sounds awesome, but turning it into a thing really difficult because it's real hard. I mean, not the recording part. That's easy. I press the button, but like getting over that inertia, getting it out in that point where I'm open to the possibility of being rejected, being praised, having it expected to finish, having a plan, having all these things. When it was just an idea, it didn't need anything other than my enthusiasm. 
But when it turns into an action, then there's an expectation that just starts showing up and it brings its friends. Auto mod keeps eating your question. Okay. Is it because you're like doing a lot of caps and stuff? Or is there a reason why the auto mod is, is eating your question? Are there emoji involved in this question? I have tried to relax the auto mod like to a ridiculous degree. Uh, I'm sorry. It's eating your question. Do you, do you want to like text it to me or, or like throw it somewhere else where I can see it and I'll be happy to answer it for you. I'm sorry. Auto mod is being garbagey. Is it just too long? Like apparently it doesn't like certain words. Yeah. There's a couple different words there. Um, uh, my auto mod blocks a lot of things like words that irritate the shit out of me, like slurs and stuff. But since I doubt very strongly, you're going to ask me a question loaded with slurs. I'm not sure why the auto mod is uh, killing your question. Um, use coded language, I guess. Just give me first letters for things. It should be fine. Um, yeah, I think I answered question seven. I got, I got kind of detoured by, you know, I can't turn the auto mod off. I don't think not from here anyway, but, um, I'm sorry. Auto mod is eating your question. Any advice on how to, oh, because you want to put all caps in. Yep. My thing doesn't like all caps. Any advice on how to market without just shouting, buy my thing at people. Yeah. 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 Actually, uh, quite a, quite a few. Um, here, we'll go back over here to seven and then we'll answer this question. Yeah. Cause the, the shouting buy my thing is, is not actually marketing. That's just screaming desperation into the void. That's not marketing. Marketing is engaging people. Marketing is about, um, expressing yourself in a different way. So, what you're going to, the easiest way I tell people to start marketing is to talk about yourself beyond just the fact that you made this thing. Cause there's gotta be a reason why you made it, right? We were just talking about having ideas and taking action. So you had an idea. What was your idea? People want to know the idea. Why? Because we like sharing ideas, especially when we are in a position to hear from someone who did turn their idea into action. So that's the kind of thing you want to tell people independent of platform specifics. I had an idea one day that I wanted to like, I, I have a deep love for professional wrestling. So I wanted to write an audio drama about wrestlers who wrestled uh, robots. That's an idea I had. Share it. Don't worry about the language specifically you use to share it. You don't have to, you know, dress it up to demonstrate your expertise or whatever other, you know, venture capitalist douchebag shit is popular right now. You just need to talk about your idea. Not buy my thing. The more you focus on here's a product, consume it, fuckers, give me money. The more you focus on the transactional nature of things, the less likely you are to market effectively because nobody likes being sold to like that. I'm sure there's some segment of the population that does, but whatever. I can't, I can't imagine who those people might be. But if we instead engage with each other and say, Hey, I had this idea one day and it's based on this and it's prompted on this because, you know, when I was a little kid, my, my parents took me to see this thing and it blew my mind. I saw star Wars and I knew all of a sudden I, I wanted to hang out in sci-fi spaces and one day I met a guy who was really interested in how stories got made more than the making of the story itself. So I thought I should get into like learning how to help people make stories. The, the how you got whatever you got is as alluring, if not more so than the thing you are offering. And that's because there is a human element to you talking about how it is you make the thing and how it is you're doing the thing that the actual, Hey, here's a product, please, you know, give me $3 and 99 cents becomes secondary. That's, that's the easiest way to explain the, a, a very core principle in selling yourself to people. You don't want to make it transactional too quickly. You don't only want to make it transactional. I have a thing, you have money, give me money for a thing. 
yeah, that works. But since you, if you keep just shouting, like, okay, you ever walk down the street or go or go somewhere and there's just some like, I don't know, lunatic fringe person. I'm not talking like a, like somebody having a, like a medical health, mental health crisis. I mean, like a, like a frothing idiot who's just blathering away, trying to get you to pay attention to them. Maybe they're wearing a certain color hat or maybe they're, they're shouting or opining about, I don't know, people who are different than them. You know, those folks, uh, do, do we, do we pay attention to them? Why? Because they are trying to just engage with you thanks to the power of volume and an unavoidable presence, not in a good positive way. Like I can't keep my eyes off, them, but more like they're just up in my fucking face. This, this idea of being just real loud and very present is what too many people, especially in creative spaces mistake for marketing because we so often talk about bad marketing. Look at this jerkwad just constantly screaming at people to buy his book. Yeah, that's not marketing. We make fun of that person because it's asinine. But that's not how we don't have to do what the bad, dumb person does in order to do what we want to do. You need to connect with a human being. One of the easiest ways to connect with a human being is, hi, I had this idea for a thing. It's, it comes from this. So I wrote this book, which is based on this idea. And I feel this way about the thing I wrote. It's really hard. I liked it. It taught me a lot about myself. And I think, you know, given that the price point is whatever the money amount is, I think it, it should be really accessible to people. And if you're interested in this book, because I really appreciate your time, if you're interested in this book, hey, click this link, check it out. That's... That is an off the top of my head sort of ham fisted way to do it. But any variation on that theme will be an effective marketing strategy. I have a lot of people come to me and go, hi, John, help me market my book. And then I ask them, hey, tell me about your book. And since that's like step one of the whole marketing chain, like we can't get anywhere in marketing unless you're able to talk about what the book is and why you wrote it. And, and they, they can't. Because to them, they're thinking about that negative, like 10% of the marketing pool. Oh, here's a product and here's the cost. Here's the product and here's the cost. Don't do that. Don't do that. Connect with human beings. It's, it's okay. Here, let's do a plug for me just because I'm here before we do question eight. If you're interested about anything I'm talking about and you want to ask a question, the best thing you can do is head over to twitch.com forward slash John helps you write better. And anytime I'm streaming, you know, if you click follow, you'll get notified. If you subscribe, you'll definitely get notified as to when I go live. And you can at any time I'm here, come and ask a question. If you're enjoying this and you want to check this out more frequently, don't forget, you can get everything I've ever streamed available as a podcast wherever you get your pods casted. I'm on all the platforms. Just search for John Helps You Write Better. I think it'll help you. That's it. I, you know, I can scream, listen to my stuff. It's important. I don't want to die. I need money. Like I can, I can scream that. Sure. I can scream that with the best of them, but that's not going to help you. My goal is to help you. And if that ever feels like it's at odds with the, the stated goal of making money, well, good, fine. I'm okay with that discrepancy. Sure, it's probably the reason why I'm not as successful as I could be. But I think it's more important that you take right action and money is a consequence of right action as opposed to money is the goal I'm trying to get. Because if money was the goal I was trying to get, shit, man, I would have paid more attention in school. You don't have to scream by your thing. You do have to talk to people, which is hard, but doable. Practice. Again, see previous question when we were talking about writing communities. These are the sort of things that should be talked about. This is the sort of thing that could happen. Not just constant sales pitching, but people talking about what they're afraid of. How do I get better at this? Don't give me a template for a pitch. Let's talk about why we get so freaked out about talking about our stuff. What are we afraid of? Spend five minutes, talk about that. It'll make a difference. Thank you for your question. On we go. Question eight. What do I do if I'm so scared of burning out? I never start anything. Oh, 
man. I f- I'm, I'm pausing because I feel this question deeply in the core of me. There are so many times I ask myself if I'm done, if I'm just too tired today, if I should just lay down and hope for tomorrow is a better day. The alarm has gone off. It's, it's you know, 5.22, 4.47 in the morning, the alarm is going off. And I'm already thinking, man, I should just, I should just take a mulligan and, and show up tomorrow burning out that end state of exhaustion, I think is a looming threat for a lot of people because we're all tired and traumatized and angry and frustrated and we feel powerless and we feel like we're missing something significant and we feel like we are being denied either actively or passively denied access to the thing or things that are going to make us better. So we push and push and push trying to accomplish something that feels Sisyphean. It feels like that boulders not really getting up all the way up the hill. And if it does, it certainly doesn't stay there very long. So we, we don't want that to happen. We don't want to be the, like the, the husked shell of ourselves, even though to some degree we already are, but we, we don't want to be totally incapable and inert. So in the best way to prevent getting to that end state is by never even starting the process that could take us to that end state. That's the thinking. Just because you start a thing does not mean it's going to end with burning out. Just like when you start writing, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to be published, but it also doesn't mean that you're going to get only a million rejections because traditional publishing isn't the only way to publish a thing, but also because you can't assume the end of something based on the start of something. You, you can't, even, even bad stuff. You can't assume that, oh my God, there's a, there's a tornado coming. My house is definitely going to get hit. You don't know. Now you can, you can do things to protect yourself. You can do things to take action, you know, when you see the bad thing coming, but there is still not a definite guarantee, no matter what, you know, people claim the, you know, planetary bodies, hundreds of millions of miles away dictate. There's no guarantee. That should not discourage you. And I think it discourages too many people. I think the idea that we don't know the future, I think the idea that we don't know the outcome of something, despite us really, really wanting a particular outcome, I think that that possibility of failure, because we have such little support and, and, and I'm going to use the word care for ourselves, we, we don't think highly enough of ourselves because we've been conditioned by a number of factors, patriarchy, capitalism, sexism, misogyny, uh, white supremacy, colonialism, et cetera, to, to think that any t- uh, Protestant work ethic, Christianity, crypto fascism, I could do this for a couple hours, you guys. Um, any time we talk about ourselves, it must be inherently bad or selfish. Because we've mistaken a fundamental idea of collectivism. We should, we should all be in this together. And we, we've decided that the minute we individuate, we're defying that collective rule, which is wrong. Uh, you are allowed to stand up and be a, have a thing you're proud of and also be a contributing member of a group. That's, you know, the, the point of having skills and talent or a gift or an ability. But we so often don't we don't, we don't big ourselves up because we don't want to be mocked. We don't want to be judged. We don't want to be denied. We don't want to be told that we're wrong. So we, we don't give ourselves the encouragement or the faith or the courage or the strength or the means to try. And then we couch it, we frame it and well, you know, it's okay. I, I, I didn't really want to try that. It's, it's better anyway. Cause I, I probably just mess it up. Or man, if I got really involved in that, it'd probably be really expensive or take a lot of time. And and it's okay. I, I'd rather, you know, justification, rationalization, put my focus elsewhere. You're not always scared of burning out. You're scared of quitting. You're scared of it not being that ideal outcome. But again, there's no guarantee as to the outcome from the start. Everybody sucks on day one. Everybody. The goal of day one is to get to day two, not from day one, go to day 10,000. And I think too often we are conditioned by hype and bullshit to only think about day one and day 10,000. 
when that's just not accurate. If you're like me and you're terribly afraid to start new things or you're terribly afraid of taking a risk because you, you know on some intellectual or emotional or both level as to like, well, I know the next 10 steps and I know how bad they could be, so I'm not even going to bother. Um, I'm sorry. I'm genuinely deeply sorry because what you and I have done, if you're the sort of person like me who does that, is you have held yourself back and you have told yourself that you had to. And um, it's it's made life hard, harder than harder than it probably needed to be. And I did it because I was scared. I did it because I didn't have enough people around me to tell me I was good enough. Uh, and and yeah, I I I'm working at a real deficit here, so I I need like a lot of people. And in addition, I need like a special subset core group of inner people too. Cause I'm, I'm real deprived in that area, but it's the idea that you held yourself back and then you told yourself, ah, I'm just trying to like conserve my focus, time and energy. No, I'm scared. Don't be scared. You can fuck up a billion times. I'm a 45 year old recovering drug addict who has blown up his life and over 10 good things in his life relationships, jobs, job opportunities, communities. I have nuked so many things. Fucking call me the American army. I just leave mushroom clouds wherever I go. It's hard when you're scared. There's no guarantee that you're going to burn out just because you started. You're allowed to start. You're allowed to be good at things. You got to be bigger than your fear. And I know the fear can feel pretty big sometimes. The fear doesn't necessarily get smaller. It's that you get braver. So I would encourage you, instead of focusing on burning out, I would encourage you to focus on doing those things, even if you do them poorly, but doing them and proving to yourself that you can do them. And then if you keep doing them, you'll get better. So then you can be a little braver tomorrow. And show up for day two and then day three and so on. And then, you know, you don't know when burnout's going to be. Burnout is not automatically at day 10,001. Burnout might be 30, 40, 50 years from now. You might never burn out. That is equally possible too. But you're never going to know any of that without starting. Next question. Question nine. If no one agrees on exact word count, and believe me, nobody agrees on exact word count, why does everyone care so much about it? What else would you like them to do with their free time? I'm sorry, I don't mean to be flippant about it, but people care about word count because it sets reader expectation. If I say, oh, I'm writing a fantasy novel, what just popped in your head? That it's huge and maybe like Game of Thrones or Dungeons and Dragons or something? Or maybe Tolkien, depending on, you know, what flavor of, of, you know, fantasy experience or science fiction you have. Those expectations are what we, we count on when we are producing work and distributing it to people. Oh, I'm in a band. Okay, what did you just picture? Like, did you just picture Nirvana or like three dudes in a garage on a Saturday? Oh, I'm, I'm on a soccer team. Did you just picture like Pele and Ronaldo or like a bunch of schlubs playing pickup games. Your expectation here matters. And word count is one of the ways in publishing we deal with and set expectation. Because when I say it's a long book, what did you just think? Must be a big word count. What if I just said it, it reads like a long book? All of a sudden, that word count doesn't seem like such a big deal. People care about it because it sets expectation. The reason why publishing, particularly traditional publishing, gets real, real prickly about word count and limits and ceilings for that is, uh, one, people are fundamentally lazy. Uh, Nobody likes doing their job at their job. So the idea that you might have to read a whole ass book 
at your job where you read books when there's already enough pressure about the number of books you read and how quickly you read them and you're supposed to make these big decisions and it's really hard and the company doesn't seem to really give a shit about that because the company never gives a shit about people. It's about books and profit and people are very slowly realizing that inside the machine. So they get real fussy about the rules. So I need to do a thing, but it needs to fit this certain set of operating conditions, even though, hey, I'm asking you to only, I need you to paint me a picture, but I don't need you to use any blue, but I need you to paint me a picture of the nights uh, of the of the sky at noon. That's what publishing is trying to frame you to do. Because if I tell you how to set a word count, you're making my life easier and maybe your life harder. People care about it because it's something to pick a fight about. People care about it because it's something to poke at with a stick because it sets an expectation. And then it's from that expectation rather than the reality that they can progress forward. Because if you tell me, oh, I'm writing a romance novel. Okay, my first thought is it's going to be somewhere in the eighty to 90,000 word range, right? And when you go, ah, it's 94,000. Okay, fine. That don't bother me. But if you were to tell that and turn that around to an imprint editor or a submissions editor somewhere, they're going 94,000 words. What the fuck is wrong with you? There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with your story. But it sets expectation. That's why they care. Word counts dumb. As long as, you know, we're not talking about absurdly long story. Like, oh, I've written a, I've written a children's book. It's 300,000 words. I, I picked hyperbole on purpose. Yes, the really large numbers for the really small things, it that's missing the point because you're you're creating the idea that you don't know how to functionally tell a story in a certain size. But the specifics past that, past the hyperbole, they don't really matter. They don't. They don't. Don't sweat so hard about it. On we go. Are there any other questions from people in chat? Is the auto mod still eating your question? With how open the internet is in terms of putting stuff out there, the big three companies in comics, Marvel, DC, and image, are they just pimps for comics in the way that agents are for novels? It's a great question. Kinda. Um, kinda. Yeah. They're I'm thinking about my answer because I want to make a distinction. Agents are pimps because they don't directly engage in the process. They just profit off the effort of other people. They make money off a percent of the sale. The sale itself is technically the transaction between publisher and and writer. And the, the, the pimp, your agent, is a middle person. They just step in between and, and, you know, yes, they've done a few things to ostensibly help your book. But that's like saying, you know, the pimp tells you to wear a different dress when you go to the hotel bar. They didn't really help you do anything. They just made a demand on your time. That's different than Marvel, DC, and Image because those people are, are publishers. They're the people through whom your work is goes out into the world. There's a level of gatekeeping there, but pimps and gatekeepers aren't the same thing because while, yeah, you could argue, I guess a, a pimp, you know, maintains a stable and dispenses them in sex trafficking as needed. The, the, the publisher really doesn't do that. The publisher isn't purposefully withholding things. They in fact have the opposite approach. Let's get everything out there as best we can. That doesn't absolve any, because really this whole discussion comes up with the idea of like submission and acceptance. What's good enough for these people? And DC Marvel and Image do want a certain bar of quality. There is a barrier to entry because there's an expectation on the audience side that something's going to be at least X degree of good. I'm making air quotes. But there's also a level of, of, performance and expectation with the work. If uh, let's use a non comic example for this. If I told you I sold uh, furniture and you said, Oh great, John, I'm in the market for a, a new chair and I hand you a piece of wood and it, it doesn't look like a chair. Uh, but I, I swear to you, I swear it's a chair, man. It's totally a chair. It has like 
one leg and and no back and it looks more like a like a frozen wooden pogo stick but it's a chair i swear it's a chair you you could sit on it i guess somehow um that that's a chair and and you get really mad at me because i that's not a chair i can't buy that because you have an expectation based on what you're looking for. Same is true for comics buyers. Same is true for comics people. They're looking for material of a certain minimum quality to, to meet the needs and they can take it from there and improve it. That's they're not, they're not pimps that way. They're gatekeepers. They get to say what does and doesn't go forward. They're not only profiting off somebody else. That's what an agent does. I'm going to just make a few phone calls and hustle for my client. I'm sorry. I had a, uh, some capitalism in my throat. So um, they do very little work, but I still want 10% of your labor. I know it took you three years to make this book, but give me that sweet 10 to 15 to 20%, depending on our deal. Yeah, that's fair. That's great. Um, oh, are, are you eating? Are you, are you going to have dinner? Could I have 20%? Because I gave you that recipe. I helped, man. Come on. Come on, give, give me 20% of your burger and fries. You, you, there is no earthly way you would give me 20% of your burger and fries if all I said was, hey, the, rest, the, the restaurant you're looking for is here's the address. There is no way that would happen. So why do we let that happen for books? But DC Image and Marvel aren't doing that. They say, hey, you have an idea, you have a thing. Great. We'd like to get that thing into a better shape than it is improve it, help you, train you, teach you, help you profit so that we can also profit. So while there is a little bit of middle manning there, they're not solely middle people. So I'm not comfortable calling DC Marvel and image pimps so much as I will call them gatekeepers because they will accept or reject things as needed to fit their own pipelines. I guess you could make an argument that agents do the same thing, but again, it comes down to look at all the things that those publishers are doing, whether we're talking DC Marvel image, you know, um, book publisher X, Y, and Z versus what did that person do? Oh, they sent an email. Okay, cool. That seems like a comparable amount of work. That's why I say what I say. Good question. Others? It occurs to me that I probably should have been using the 20% burger and fries thing for years. It's a really, really good way to explain things. Yeah, going forward, we're going to do the 20% burger and fries. That's, hell yes, let's go. Go me. On we go, though. Still got more to do. Question 10. You've said that Andor is the greatest Star Wars story. It is. I'm not going to argue. It is, flat out, the best piece of Star Wars media ever, 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 for a number of reasons. How do I write something that affects people like that? Oh, oh, okay. Let me tell you exactly how to, I, while the specifics of here's exactly how to do Andor is something I'm actually saving for a stream, probably, probably in December, I think. Um, the, the, the impact you want is good. It's good to have an impact like that. But what you want to do is make sure you are not necessarily duplicating Andor. Don't clone the show. But the reason it makes that impact is because, one, the majority of Andor is very, very practical. It's not a lot of CG. It doesn't feel very fakey fake. It doesn't feel, like, manufactured to that degree. Two, it's not actively cashing in on a lot of reference and nostalgia. So you're, you're not leaning on other things to tell your story. Yes, it does fit into the jigsaw puzzle of the overall Star Wars world or Star Wars story, but it's not like we have a, a CG version of a famous character to help sell our idea or, oh, we brought the actor back or, oh, we have these, you know, less than subtle references to like, oh, we're just going to have him be the guy again. It's a whole new thing. And then the message itself is organized and simple. It's not trying to be fan service. It's not trying to be the next great chapter and an amazing person we already know 90% about. It's not trying too hard to be huge. It's just trying to be honest about 
this little thing that is practical and grounded and devoid of nostalgia. It's not trying to be the greatest hit of somebody else, but with a new like t-shirt, it's trying to be something sincere that addresses each point that it makes. So in each of its story arcs, there's something specific that we can point to the cause, the effort, the challenge, and the resolution. Cause, effort, challenge, resolution. Those four things are sort of the real central tenets of any impactful story, whether we're talking Andor or Lord of the Rings or Rocky or The Karate Kid or, let me find a not sports movie, um, Oppenheimer or any uh, Tenet or Memento or let's find something that Christopher Nolan didn't direct, uh, Raging Bull. Uh, it's a sports movie that doesn't really count. Um, the M- Great Muppet Caper. Anything, any Animal House, the Blues Brothers, um, Saturday Night Live's first three years. Anything that has an impact on you can be broken down into those four things. And it's because of those four things, not just isolated into a single scene. Oh, this is the scene with the challenge. But because there is a constant understanding of the way each story does its job and moves on to the next. That's where you get impact. And the fact that everything is grounded and the fact that everything is anchored and the fact that it's not heavy in reference and the fact that it's not like, look at all the big giant LED screens that make, you know, this green screen stage look like the middle of nowhere. It's instead filmed in the middle of nowhere. So it feels practical. Practical writing goes a long way. You want to make somebody feel like they're in a scene where, you know, grandma is talking about how she's not sure she can keep the house. You, you don't dick around and say very little about the house. You talk about the house. You, you talk about the linoleum that's peeling up. You talk about the st- the nicotine stains in the wall from grandpa. You used to smoke a pipe. You talk about the window and the air that seeps through. You talk about the train that's rattling on overhead. You talk about the dead tree outside that used to have a tree swing that you remember when you were five. You, you ground the reader in the place and the feelings of that place so that when you have this terrible scene about how grandma's not sure she can keep the house and she just got off the phone with the bank and it's this whole big thing and now our, our story is going to take you know, this part where clearly the best thing to do is have the grandkids like they're preteens but they're going to rob the fucking bank. The reason we make that impactful is not because, golly gee, we have all the snarky dialogue. It's because I made you give a shit about grandma's house. Look for the small things. Look for the straightforward story structure that you can anchor someone into that will connect with them no matter who they are. Because while maybe you've never grown up with a grandma or you've never known the sheer joy of being left outside to play with a tree swing or you've never experienced that sense of frustration when you get off the phone, there is still something here somewhere in your story that will hit somebody hard and knock, knock their socks off. That's how you write something like Andor. The socks knocker offer of Star Wars. Andor stream coming soon. I'm going to end up having to make screen grabs, but we'll get there. All right. I'm going to go to the next question. Question 11. You tell writers to practice often. I do. I tell them to practice as much as possible. Do you practice coaching? I do. Um, often that means, uh, all right, so on like a, like a chat day, uh, if I don't have meetings during the morning, uh, today I had meetings, but uh, that, you know, over the weekend and yesterday, Monday and uh, Sunday in particular, I not only rehearse the questions, like how am I going to read this? What am I going to say? Do I need to change the graphic? Do I need to like throw this question out? Cause the answer is kind of like too short or too long or too rambly. You know, I, I think about, okay, so I've got four questions about this. I got two questions about that. Oh, there's that really good question about, uh, and, or what am I going to say? And I don't necessarily rehearse and script my answer, but I at least try to like get it into a boundary. Okay. I'm going to talk about Andor. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about how disappointing like the book of Boba Fett was. 
because while that is a thing I feel, it's not related specifically to how I want to answer the end or question. So I do practice talking. I do practice how am I going to communicate this idea? I do it more, not so much for the chat, but for streams or for sessions with people where I know like, okay, so tomorrow, for instance, I, I'm going to talk to somebody at 10 o'clock in the morning and I know the problems they're experiencing with their chapter. And yeah, we're going to go over a chapter. Uh, and I went through and they, I read their stuff and I left them the notes. I did the, the material work of it, but we're still going to have a conversation because we left it hanging last time uh, about a problem they're going through. And so I thought about, you know, three, four, five different ways to come at this problem and what metaphors I can use and what analogies I can use and what books I can recommend they read. And yes, I can't guarantee that a hundred percent of everything I've practiced will end up in our conversation, but it, it's at least given me the sense of confidence that, okay, if it goes this way, I know what to do. If it goes that way, I know what to do. I'm as prepared as I can be so that when I encounter this other person and we start talking somehow, some way, I won't try to steer the conversation towards where I'm comfortable because coaching is a conversation where I want to steer towards where you want to go, but I'm at least feeling pretty limber, feeling pretty capable. And that just comes from talking. I talk to the cat. Uh, I talk to myself. Um, back in the day, if I was, you know, um, if I had other people around on the regular, I'd talk to them and annoy the shit out of them with it. But, um, yeah, I practice, I, I practice. It's interesting. Cause I end up talking in talking here in chat. I say a thing like the burger and fries metaphor for agents. And all of a sudden like, Oh, that's awesome. And I make a quick little note. And I know the next time that it comes up with somebody in a session or something, I will mention burger and fries. You can practice coaching, or at least I practice coaching. I should say in any time I communicate outwardly. It's when it just stays in my head and I'm just thinking aggressively, like I've got my headphones on and I'm, you know, the music is there, but I'm not really like paying attention, but I'm just, I'm just in the zone of like thinking. It's not the same. It's harder to practice. I need to be able to, to get the words out and, and not necessarily hear me say them, but think about what somebody on the other side of it, the, the recipient might say or think, does that sound stupid? Does that sound confusing? Chances, I mean, I know the people I talk to well enough that I know if I'm going to say a thing, they're going to, you know, make a face or misunderstand or just do that thing where they go, uh, uh huh. And that's usually code for, I have no idea what the fuck you're saying. And I go from there, but it, it comes from rehearsal. It comes from prep. Yes. I practice a lot. On we go. Question. I got to, oh man. All right, hang on. There's a mouthful of water. This is a long ass one. Question 12. How do I deal with the jealousy I feel when I see others doing these big things and I'm not? How do I deal with the feelings that I'm never going to be good enough like that? Oh man, question. Just kick me in the teeth, why don't you? Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Just because somebody else is doing something really big, maybe they're a bestseller, maybe they've published, maybe they got a book deal from a pimp, maybe they, maybe they launched a new thing, maybe they put out merch, maybe they, whatever they started doing, doesn't really matter. I think it's normal, not necessarily the healthiest thing in the world, but I think it's pretty normal to watch people around you doing things you wish you were doing and feel something because of it. Oh, I wish I was good like that. I wish I thought of that. Not so much I had the idea and deprive them of their joy, but just I wish I had the courage to do that. I think that's pretty normal. The The best way I have found, I'm just going to do the first question first. The best way I've found to counter that jealousy specifically is to, instead of trying to force it and go, yeah, well, I'm going to do my own thing and I'm going to work 10 times harder and, you know, eat rocks, buddy. Rather than try to take it as like some kind of great personal challenge, because um, there's there's no point in doing that, because I don't believe in myself enough, that's part two, so that I'm always going to feel like I'm going to be inadequate in the end. Anyway, um, rather than deal with the jealousy by doubling down and challenging them, I sit down and look at what I've successfully done. Not so much what I've done that they haven't, this isn't like a tit for tat thing, 
It's more a matter of, okay, they're doing stuff. Ah, oh, they're a bestseller. Oh, they won an award. They did this. They did that. That's, that's great. Good for them. That's, it, it sucks that I'm not brave enough to do those things or try those things. But here's what I have done. And it doesn't necessarily always feel comparable because some days it's, I didn't do drugs and they just won an award. So those two things don't feel the same, but at the same time, like they're both really big deals and they're both really difficult to do. And I have to kind of talk myself around that quality or that equity of things. Um, because it's in that equity. I can stay jealous. Well, they won an award. I haven't won an award. Oh, okay. I'm not interested in winning awards though. When you encounter this jealousy, you got to narrow down and, and really get into what it is you're jealous of. Is it the specific outcome? Oh man, they're a bestseller. I want the praise they're getting. I want 10 people on Twitter to, you know, who I don't know to tell me, good job. I bought your book. Like if that's what you want, we can, we can build you a system to get that. It's going to take some time and effort, but we can get you there. If it's just the general sense of like, they're having good things happen. I would also like to have good things happen. Then we can plug and play anything good. Go make some fucking brownies. Uh, I don't know. Go, go watch a cat video. Watch something that makes you laugh. There are loads of ways we can get you some dopamine. Get specific with your jealousy. And see if you can find something either to like poke it with a stick and diffuse it. Or recognize that in that jealousy, you are discounting your own accomplishment. That's question one. Question two. Oh, how do I deal with the feelings that I'm never going to be good enough to be like that? All right. Honestly, I struggle with this every day. I have a really small following. I believe most of them are in chat right now. Um, really small following, really small podcast, really small client list. And a really small bank account, if we're being honest. And I know people in my field have bigger things across all those fronts. Far more money, far more clients, far more notoriety, far more, I guess, success because they have far more people with positive testimonials or something, I guess, or they just talk bigger. And it can lead me to feel like I'm not good enough. The hardest thing in the world, I think, for any creative person to do is to sit down and have that moment where they begin to accept that their value and worth is not dictated by the accomplishment or effort of someone else. I think that's the hardest thing in the goddamn world to do. I think it's easier to cure cancer. Um, because we are so often told by a million thousand. There's another question on discord. Hang on. There is another question. I'll get there. Sorry. I'm coming back to my other point before I forget it. How do I do with the feelings? I'm not good enough. The, the hardest thing in the world is, um, detaching your value from someone else's effort. It's real hard because we get messaging from all different corners at all different times that, um, that our worth is conditional and our value and our success is conditional is capitalism mostly, but, um, it's hard to accept otherwise when our only measuring, uh, our only unit of measurement for our success is something that is spe uh, specifically, uh, values competition or scarcity. Like we're only as good as our bank account size. So if that's the case, then, um, short of you doing the same kind of thing for the same kind of price and having the same kind of results, which are not necessarily guaranteeable or possible, uh, you will not be good enough on that level. But if you are able to push away from that and go, yeah, I'm not going to be like that but I can be good and I can be good enough for me separate from that, then it is possible to sort of like spin and rotate this thing to get you feeling a little bit better. Your goodness and your value and your ability are 
not based on your downloads, your sales, your stars, your ratings, and your reviews, and the number of people who follow, like, share, or subscribe, whatever. I know it can so often feel that way because everybody else seems to be making it a big deal, and you can feel pretty stupid for constantly having to talk into a microphone and say, hey, you're you're not based on your your client base. You're you're there's there's more to it than numbers. And it's in those moments where, like right now, I'm having one, where you start wondering, like, I must not be good enough because I'm not the one buying a new car for my kid based on, you know, the bullshit I sold on Facebook. I I go back to the number of conversations I've had with people where they published a book and they thought they'd never. Or the, the client who said, I feel like I have a real editor for the first time ever. Or the, the tearful conversation I had with somebody where they said, I never, thought, um, I never thought I'd be able to hold my book in my hands. Or um, I never thought I'd finish. I never thought I'd start. Stuff like that. Stuff that doesn't have an easily quantifiable price tag because it seems so huge to them. That's what I do. That's what makes me good at my job. And that is a thing from which I derive a great deal of satisfaction in life. There are other things, sure. But that's a big work thing for me. And I think when you find that big work thing for you, I think when you find the the joy for yourself in what you're doing, not necessarily only in the fantasy or daydream or hope or whatever of the end result, but you remember that, oh, I like, I like writing. I like writing fantasy because I read that book series as a kid. I like sci-fi because I, I like Star Wars. I like this. I like that. And holding on to that tightly, not in an effort to prove to other people that you're valuable or prove to other people that you're good enough, but just to hold on to that because you like it it becomes a lot easier to succeed. It becomes a lot easier to make the progress you want to make because you stop sweating what everybody else is doing. It's hard. It's really hard. And I got to tell you, I backslide on it a lot. But it's not about doing it once and only going forward. It's about the steps forward and the steps back and the steps forward again. It's a whole journey. And then on, on a broader answer to your question, get some fucking therapy. One of the best things in the world for your creative efforts is to go get help with mental health, confidence, emotions, anxiety, whatever, and have some resource to be able to take some of that off your plate so that you can breathe. It makes a huge difference. You might not truly know eternal constant peace, but relief matters a great deal. Think that over. All right. Now there is another question in, in over here and I do want to answer it because it is important. And I apologize for bouncing all over the place. Here we go. Uh, so I just realized something about myself. I don't usually consider pre-writing or outlining, etc., to be part. Oh, excuse me. I don't usually consider pre-writing or outlining to be part of the writing process. It's just something I need to do in the process. Is No, I, I read that question wrong. I don't usually consider pre-writing or outlining to be part of writing. It's just something I need to do. Is this a mindset you've come before, and is there something I need to change or address? Yeah, uh, you, that attitude sucks. Uh, I'm sorry. They're, they're, that's, that's terrible. That's half the reason why you jam yourself up. It's, it's cause the, the, the word you want to hang your hat on is the word need because you're making that sound like, Oh, I need, uh, I need to take the dog out for a walk. And it can be a nuisance because, Hey, you want to play a video game or you want to take a nap or you're, you know, you're on the phone or you're, you're doing something. Don't frame it at pre-writing, which is a terrible term, outlining book prep, story prep, all that stuff. Those aren't unfortunate needs. You're not only doing them because some traditional publisher will be satisfied in their demands by you having done them. You're not trying to make mom happy that you cleaned your room kind of a thing when you very clearly wanted to be outside doing whatever. This is not that. 
This is more a matter of if you do these things, outlining book prep, character decision making, scene writing, making a list, whatever the hell it is, it makes it easier for do the thing you want to be doing. It's let's use a food metaphor. You want to make a meal. Doesn't matter what meal it is. If you spent the time cutting up all the vegetables, washing everything, putting, measuring everything out and putting it into its own little cup or something, or at least getting all the stuff out of the pantry and putting it on the counter so that you can use it or getting the water boiling before you really get started or any of those other steps, all those pre and prep steps. That means that just means it's going to be easier for you to move forward and do the thing, cook dinner that you wanted to do in the first place. So yeah, I run into that attitude a lot from people who have a, like a really deep seated expectation for how writing is supposed to be and how writing needs to be and how their process is something that should not change because it's gotten them results this far. I've been doing it this way for this long and this is where I'm at. And, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to change your process. But I do want to point out that I've been driving this way this whole time is also the strategy of driving that got you into the car accident that we're currently talking about. Your process is not so immutable and should not be so immutable that you can't adapt and evolve it. And it might feel like pre-writing or outlining or whatever you want to call it really sucks, but that might also be because you've got some kind of huge expectation about how it's supposed to look or what it's supposed to feel like or what it's supposed to do that it's obviously not doing. And that's because you're thinking it's supposed to be, you know, one thing when it's another. It is something you need to look at. It is something you need to question and challenge. It is something you need to address because I, it, it doesn't need to be a huge thing. No one's asking you to make a story Bible literally every time. Sometimes your scene list is just going to be go to the, you know, they go to the store, they go to the mall, they go to that house, they go to this house, they drive down the street. How long did that possibly take me? Right? Like it doesn't need to be scene one chapter, you know, scene one lines five to seven, say this eight to nine, say that 10 to seven. It doesn't need to be broken down to that degree. No one's going to see it but you. You can do the bare minimum here, and that's fine. But you're not doing it just a tick box. Like, I have done this thing. I have, you know, put batteries in the object. It It's more than that. It's the idea that you're doing it to make your life easier down the road. And resisting that, resisting the outlining, resisting the prep, resisting the organization so that you can, what, fly by the fucking seat of your pants? What do you, what do you want, a cookie? Like, I, I love you. I don't, I don't want you to, to make this harder for yourself, but there's nothing gained in being too proud or noble. And I'm not saying you're doing this. I'm, I'm answering a broader question, addressing people who are not the person who asked this question. There's nothing proud or noble in, in, you know, I don't do that. Who gives a shit? It will help you accomplish the goal you want to accomplish. If you're really serious about your goal, why wouldn't you take advantage of every tool available to help you accomplish that goal? You don't, you don't get a bigger reward for having done it in a specific way. If you're uncomfortable doing the thing, if you don't like doing the thing, if you think it's dumb, that's fine. That's super fine. Then say so. But understand, you're still going to have to accomplish the same tasks of what the hell happens next in my story. How do I organize all my thoughts? It's just that you're going to express them in a different way. It's it's not an automatic like danger, Will Robinson, danger, oh no, red alert. It, it's not like a super problem that's going to be a thing, but it definitely is part of, I think, a slippery slope to really make things harder for you. I'm not saying that doing it will suddenly make your life easier, like super easy. It's not going to suddenly switch the, the difficulty mode to like beginner, but it's, it's really going to make the tougher parts you run into a lot smoother and maybe not necessarily as frustrating. A little outlining goes a long way. A little bit of prep helps make things a lot easier. It's worth really considering as valid as drafting. Really and truly, I swear. On we go. 
13th question. How do I know when I've done a good job? Oh, what is it today with questions that just really want to, you know, hit me in the teeth? I can't tell you when you've done a good job. I can say the words, you've done a good job. I can tell you that I'm proud of you. I can tell you that you were a very good person and that you did good. It's up to you to believe me. It's up to you to internalize someone else giving you the external stuff, telling you praise, and for you to accept it and then have you, you know, have you do it. And there comes a point where you have to learn how to do it. And if you're like me and you've struggled with it forever, it can feel like you're cheating or you're breaking some kind of rule or you're, 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 you're getting one over on everybody or you're doing it wrong. When you tell yourself like, yeah, I did a good thing. Fuck yeah. Let's fucking go. Um, yeah, it can feel really, really weird that way. And you might feel like if you're like me, you might feel potentially embarrassed like, oh man, I hope no one notices that I am like, you know, incredibly celebrating the, the, the accomplishment of doing this chat by rocking out to eighties hair metal at max volume. First of all, there's nobody else around right now. I am free and clear to do that to the volume I desire because God damn it. At best, I'm lo it's my hearing that's affected and whatever. I listen to loud music for my entire life. My hearing's going to go whatever. But you get to determine, you get to choose, you get to figure out what it means for you to have done a good job. And it's okay for you to express that to yourself and then to the world, maybe not in that order, that you are proud of your accomplishment. I think for a lot of people, this comes down to two parts. Part one is knowing that you've done a job entirely. Hey, I wrote a draft. Not, hey, I wrote the perfect thing that I never have to write again. That is no part of it is boring or bad or wrong and it doesn't suck. Too many people I talk to, too many people I talk to, um, spend a lot of time tearing themselves down while writing really well. You, you don't need to. And yeah, it's embarrassing and awkward because you'll say, oh, well, I'm such and such and so and so and I've been doing this for so long and whatever. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You get to tell yourself that everything you have done that, you know, didn't immediately blow up in your face. You know, the computer didn't crash. The disc didn't auto format. You know, the power didn't go out. You didn't, you know, lose, you know, bodily autonomy or something. Anything like that is, is a success. I wrote a sentence. Fuck yeah. Wrote two sentences. Yeah, now we're doing it. You know, it's. I don't know if you can hear this, but there apparently is either a 1940s bombing raid going on or like six landscapers have moved into my neighbor's yard. What the holy hell is making that? Anyway, I'll deal with that in a minute. I'm going to yell at those people for sure. Anyway, good jobs. Good jobs come in many sizes. The expectation that a good job is only the job well done in its totality at its full size is holding you back from recognizing accomplishment. Everything you've done that is an accomplishment, not perfect, just accomplished, is worth praise. You did it. Yay. And if you're somebody like me who grew up in the exact opposite of that environment, and I understand that I'm in my mid-40s and I'm now talking to you about things that were 40 years ago. If you grew up in that environment where like, oh, all right, the cat's gone. Um, if you grew up in that environment where... It feels weird just to be proud that like you did things that are too simple or it's stupid. Um, you will always look for ways to deny yourself acceptance of a good job. Why would I say I did good? It's, it's a thing I should always be doing. Why do I need to praise that? Because you should praise that. You should praise everything you do. You should praise your accomplishment. It doesn't make you arrogant. It doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make you a weirdo. It doesn't make you a loser. It doesn't mean you suck. It doesn't do anything like that. You are allowed to say you did a great job eating that sandwich. Go ahead. Who's going to be bothered by that? Who's going to know? But if it makes you happy, if it makes you feel good that, yeah, I ate that sandwich and didn't spill it all over my shirt, 
There are days, you and I both know, there are days where that is a fucking victory. So why not call it out? Who cares if it's silly? Silly according to whom? It helped you feel good. Is feeling good bad? Because that's, that's what we're talking about. You're denying yourself the ability to recognize good accomplishment. You're denying yourself the ability to say that it's okay to feel good. You've done a good job writing when there are words on the page that weren't there before. Period. One word, 10 words, 1,000 words, 3,000 words, 10,000 words, whole chapter, five chapters, the whole fucking act, the whole book, whatever. Who gives a shit? Is there something there now that wasn't there before? Then you did good. Have some air horns. Do you know why I have air horns on the board? Because I want to be able to feel that good all the damn time. Somebody says, oh, I wrote today. Yeah, it's fucking goofy. It's obnoxious. They're loud and I love them because it's silly. I like the idea that praise can come at any time. And I'm in charge of dispensing that. Not to you because you have to win my approval, but I'm in charge of dispensing that to me in the same way that you're allowed to dispense it to you as you want. And that's because you did good. Because you did a thing. Even if you fucked it up, even if you fell off your bike, even if you dropped the thing, even if you spilled it all over the floor, even if you burnt it, even if you deleted five words you wrote, even if you didn't finish today, even if you still have more to go, you did it. It didn't just stay this abstract thing that remains undone and only a thought at best. You did a thing. You transformed thought into action. Remember that previous question where we had a ton of ideas and no follow through? Following through is what we're trying to get to. That's our goal. Not judging our follow through, not critiquing ourselves to the point of frustration because the degree of our follow through wasn't perfect according to some bullshit standard. Just that we did it. One more thing. Please remember that in these questions, I am as much talking to myself as to you. You did a good job today. You're going to keep doing good jobs today. You're probably going to do good jobs tonight. Will th some jobs, some good jobs be better jobs than others? Yeah, totally. But you'll do some good jobs along the way. You are allowed to recognize when you have succeeded. You are allowed to feel good about it. You do or do not have to share that you've done these things. You do not need to, you know, celebrate your goodness on the condition that other people first tell you that it's okay. You can just be excited and hype for things. You can just be proud of a thing. You can just do a thing. I know that seems weird, but I promise it helps. You've done a good job. You get to determine when that is. And if you keep moving the goalpost on it, well, then you're really just making it harder for yourself. And I'm sorry, and I wish you wouldn't. Have some more air horns. You are worth it. Are there any other questions? before we get out of here and I go deal with however many landscapers are next door. No. Yes. I apologize for coughing before. Seriously. How many people are next door? It's lunacy. Shall we get out of here? Go to that sweet, sweet outro. Yes. Let's go to that outro. Can I point out that as I go to the outro, they stop lawn mowing and blowing leaves and whatever else they're doing? Jerks. Anyway, I don't think they can hear me. I know I can hear them. That doesn't really matter. It just frustrates me that whatever, it's fine. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for enduring me coughing and losing my train of thought a couple times and dealing with the landscapers and everything else. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you for asking your questions. Thanks for checking this out. Thanks for just doing all the things you do. They mean the world to me, and I really hope 
I really hope you're doing okay. And I hope you continue to keep trying your best. All power to all people. You are more than good enough. Do something good for yourself. Feel good. Take off your pants. Have some chocolate. Eat a snack. Play a game. Laugh. Watch something dopey. Laugh about some. I don't know. Feel fucking good. You're allowed to. You're good enough. If you need permission, there it is. Go enjoy it. I love you. Thanks for being here. The next time I'm here in your eyes and in your ears will be next week. I am going for two things next week. You know what? Let's put me on the hook. Not only will I be here for the writer's chat on um, the 22nd, no, no, sorry, the 21st, the 21st, the Tuesday prior to American Thanksgiving, I, I do want to do something. Maybe Monday night, maybe Monday night we'll do Andor. Monday night, right here, 7 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, fuck it, 7 p.m. Eastern. We'll do a stream. Maybe it'll be Andor. I don't know. Stay tuned to the newsletter available at johnhelpsyourwritebetter.com for more details. Yeah, that sounds good. Put me on the hook for something, John. Let's do it. Two nights back to two days. Yeah, let's go. Bang, bang. All right. Until then, I love you. I'll talk to you soon. See you.